Thank you, you guys. You can grab a seat. We are continuing our discussion in this sermon series. It's all question and answers. And this sermon series geared around the topic of angels. Actually, good, pure angels and fallen angels. We kind of call them in our language angels and demons. And I'm going to be honest with you. There are some people that are really struggling at this point. As a pastor, I realized that last week's sermon about Satan and this week when we talk about possession and exorcism, this can get really dark for some people. There's been a couple of people that have been connected with our church who have said, Jeff, I need to take a break from this sermon series. And here's why I need to take a break. This topic is way too real for me. It's so real that it's overwhelming me right now because I am acutely aware of all of the evil and all of the temptation around me. And I'm getting overwhelmed by the circumstances. So I'm just going to step back for a moment. And I totally understand if that's where someone is coming from. But there's also someone who's communicated and saying, Jeff, I don't like the topic. I want to talk about the good stuff. And so I'm going to kind of step away from this sermon series until we get back into the gospel of John and we can talk about the good stuff. And for that person, I just want to warn you, I wish I had a way of making this topic today more upbeat, but I don't. And I want to beg you, please don't bury your head in the sand on this topic today. We're going to wrap this whole sermon series up next week. We're going to try to put a bow on it and hopefully give you a lot of encouragement. But today, I want to just get real and I want to get honest about evil, the evil that's all around us every day. And what I really need you to understand from this message today, I'll put it on the screens for you in just a moment. I need you to understand that you cannot walk away from this spiritual fight. Everyone on the planet is involved in this fight. Whether you want to be, whether you acknowledge it, whether you believe it or not, you are part of this spiritual battle that's happening all over the world. We can't see it with our eyes, but it doesn't make it any less real. Jesus wanted his disciples to know this right out of the gate. So when he called them, he called them out of their sin and into a relationship with them, and then immediately put them on war footing in Matthew chapter 10. In fact, the Bible describes it this way. This is how the Bible describes Jesus calling his first disciples. And I just need you to know, this is still true to this day when Jesus called you out of your sin and into his army. Summoning the 12 disciples, he, Jesus, gave them authority over fallen angels, unclean spirits. We're using the word demons today. He gave them authority over demons to drive them out and to heal every disease and sickness. This was part of the original call of Jesus. He called you out of the enemy's team and to be on his team, and then he put you on war footing to go do battle for his glory around the world. This is true of me. It's true of every Christian that's ever lived anywhere on the planet. So if you're overwhelmed by evil and you're checking out right now because it's too much for you, I totally get it and my heart goes out to you. I'm praying for you. But for those people that are saying, I don't like this topic and I'll join back when you start talking about something different, I need you to remember you can't walk away from this. Even if you want to, it's all around you every day. And so what I want to do is just get real honest about demon possession and about exorcism, about casting out demons today. And some of you asked some really, really good questions that I've tried to categorize into four big things to think about when we talk about this today. The first question which was asked in a multitude of different ways, is, hey, the way that I read demon possession in the Bible, does that still happen today? Or here's the way some other people worded this question. Somebody asked, how prevalent is demon possession? What does it look like, and how common is it? Another one of you asked it this way. The Bible speaks about people that were possessed by demons. What does that look like, and how should we as Christians react to that? 
Well, I hope by the time we get to the end of the sermon, you'll have an answer to the last part of that question. But the specific question that's on the screens for us right now, is there still demon possession today, just like in the Bible? Very easy answer, yes. And I'll show you how that question is easy to answer in just a moment. But I need us to do a little bit of work. So there's two things that I want you to do for me right now. One is to go ahead and pull out your phone and to open up the mobile app, click on the button that says today's sermon. I want you to take a note in that notes part of today's sermon about this word possession that we're going to talk about a lot today, because I need to define this term for us. But second, as we're going along, because you already have your phone out, you can do this at home, you can do this in this room, either on YouTube or on Facebook, if you will cue into our live service right now, if I say something that you don't understand or it causes a question, put that in the notes to this broadcast right now today, and before this sermon is over with, I'm going to do my best to answer your questions live during this service. What do you mean exactly by the word possession? That's really what I need to get at for just a second. I can unequivocally answer the question, yes, but yes, based on the way the Bible describes possession, is in your mind what you're reading in the Bible, are these two things the same? Because here's what Acts chapter 10 says about demon possession after Jesus's death, resurrection, and ascension back to heaven. It says that, you know, this starts in verse 37, you know the events that took place throughout all of Judea, beginning from Galilee after the Jesus's baptism, after Jesus's baptism, that the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, listen to this, with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all of those who were under the tyranny of the devil because God was with him. Right there in your mobile app, I want you to write in the notes the word tyranny. And I want to define that for you. That word is the word that you would use to describe under the rule of an oppressive leader. And you live in the kingdom of a bad king, a tyrant. The Bible is describing the devil as a tyrant that has control over his people. And Jesus went about doing good and rescuing people from the tyranny of the devil. That's what Jesus' mission was on earth. By the way, that's what he left his church on earth to do after he returned to heaven. When you see the word possession in the Bible, generally speaking, it refers to ownership. It specifically shows up in the Bible most often. This may be interesting for you, both Old and New Testament, to refer to people's land. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. When the Bible says they possess the land, they own the land, it doesn't mean that you can pick the land up and carry it around with you, right? It just means that this plot of land that was given by God, that belongs to me, and I have ownership of it. One of these days, I'm going to die, and the ownership will pass on to somebody else. The possession of the land will pass on to my descendants. But for right now, I have control or ownership of the land. I think some people, when they use the word possession by demons today, they're thinking fall down, foam at the mouth kind of possession. And if that's what you have in mind, I believe that still happens today. In fact, I think I've seen it. But I want you to hear the word possession, demon possession, it really means under the ownership or under the control, under the ruling tyranny of the devil. If that's the question you're asking unequivocally, yes, that still happens literally to everyone on the planet that hasn't been supernaturally rescued by Jesus. Now, let me define it a little bit further for you. Because in the book of Acts, you you see this phrase tyranny to refer to the possession of the devil or evil spirits. But in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it gives this vivid description of what that might be like. Verse 22 or 25. 
Perhaps God will grant them, people that are under the control of the devil, perhaps God will grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. Look at what it says next. Then they may come to their senses, look at this word, and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. That word captive in the Bible is the word prisoner. And it's saying that until Jesus steps in and supernaturally rescues someone, they're a prisoner or under the possession of the evil spirits or of the ultimate evil spirit of the evil one of the devil himself. So when I, when people ask the question, does the kind of Demon possession that we see in the Bible, does that still happen today? Oh, yes, it does. And it happens literally to everyone you know that hasn't been supernaturally born again by the work of the Holy Spirit of the living God. Next question. Can a demon possess a Christian? This is a fascinating question. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you an Old Testament verse. I'm going to show you a New Testament verse. And then I want you to answer this question out loud. You ready? Old Testament, 1 Chronicles chapter 21. This is a reference to David. We have to ask the question, is it certain that David was a Christian using Old Testament terminology? Would you say yes, that David was absolutely a Christian? Thank you. Three people that answered out loud. Thank you for answering correctly. Yes, absolutely. And so now look at what 1, Corinthians, or 1 Chronicles 21 says happens to David. Satan rose up against Israel. And since David is Israel's leader, Satan incited David to count the people of Israel to basically have this great sense of pride and he gets arrogant and this is an event that will lead to the death of many thousands of people in Israel. What happened that prompted David to count all of the people of Israel? Well, it was an ultimately the work of the devil in his heart that prompted David to do this. Old Testament passage. New Testament passage comes from 1st Chronicle or first Corinthians and in first Corinthians Paul who's writing a letter to the church that he started he's gone he's on a road trip and he hears some disturbing news about wicked sexual sin this is people in the church that have been born again and they have committed this wicked sexual sin and Paul makes a statement about what to do with these people next first Corinthians chapter 5 this is church discipline described for us in the New Testament when you assemble in the name of the Lord Jesus this is when the church comes together and I am with you in spirit I'm on the road and so I'm not there physically but I am with you in spirit when you assemble in the name of the Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, hand over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now, I want to make sure that you understand what kind of person Paul is referring to here. Hand this person over to Satan so that they can destroy, Satan can destroy his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. You see in... Old Testament example of David, you see a New Testament example of this Christian in the Corinth church that has started to commit this wicked sin. And Paul says, I want you to hand him over to Satan and let Satan have his way with him so that his soul may end up uh, being convicted about what he's done. So now you have an Old Testament and a New Testament example to answer this question. Can demons possess, have some degree of control over a Christian? I want you to answer that out loud. Based on what you've just seen from the Bible, yes, if we're not careful, you and I could start to slip into sin. And when you start to slip into sin, you can start to go down a really bad road really fast. And eventually you're still born again, but now your soul has been 
uh, now the evil spirits have started to take control over your actions. They have started to possess a little bit of authority over you. I don't want you to hear you're not on your way to heaven. I do want you to hear that a Christian can easily fall back into temptation if you're not on guard. And the whole reason that I'm using these two passages is you have one of the greatest examples of following Jesus in the Old Testament. This happens to you have a church planted by one of the greatest church leaders in the New Testament, and it's happening in that church. It can happen to you, it can happen to me, and it can happen in this church as well. All right, I love this question, and because I love the guy who wrote this question, I couldn't leave it alone. So here it is in your mobile app or on the screens. If I, air quotes, a fit young man fought with, and I'm guessing we're talking in a cage match, in the octagon, bare knuckles. If I got into a fist fight with a normal angel, would I win? Thank you for qualifying the question because I'm assuming we're, out, we're ruling out by the word normal. We're not talking about Michael and we're not talking about Lucifer. But if it's just me and a regular angel, how would that go if I was in the octagon with him? I wanted to have a little bit of fun with this question but I also put this question on the screens because I think it's actually a really, really important question. Would I win if I got into a fight? No, you would not win. No, you wouldn't even stand a chance. Can I remind you that the death angel passed through Egypt and annihilated every male firstborn in the entire land in one night? You couldn't stand or you couldn't hold your own against that one. How about the angel that went through the camp of the good, pure angel that went through the camp of the greatest military force on earth, the Assyrian army, and annihilated 185,000 of them in one night? How do you think you're going to do against that guy? My answer to you is no, you're not going to win in that fight. And I put this question on the screens as a warning to all of us. Here's the warning. Acts chapter 19. Paul, the apostle, God has given him such a great power that when he wipes the sweat off his forehead and people use that handkerchief to touch others, demons come out and the dead come back to life. Paul isn't even there, just the handkerchief that he wiped his sweat or the corners of his mouth with. That handkerchief is causing demons to come out with a shriek. Well, there's some Jewish leaders that see this kind of raw power and they decide I want to try what Paul's trying. So they get into, they pick a fight with a demon, an evil angel. These are the sons of Sceva. And let me tell you how the fight goes when they pick a fight with an evil spirit. Acts chapter 19, verse 14. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, and we don't know whether or not this high priest was a Christian. Let's assume that he's not. So we don't know about his seven sons. Let's assume that they're not. Maybe they are. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this, trying to cast out demons. An evil spirit answered them and said, I know Jesus, and I recognize Paul, but who are you? And then the man had the, the man, one man with one evil spirit, the man with the evil spirit jumped on them. Let, look at this. Check this out. What happens next? And he prevailed against seven brothers at one time, and they all ran out of the house beat up and naked. That's how bad this thing went down. So my advice to you is if you think you can just roll up your sleeves and on your own power get into a fight with a demon, don't, because it's not going to go well for you. And again, I'm bringing this up because I really want you to understand the spiritual forces of evil that are out there trying to harm you, and trying to harm your neighbor. But I also want you to hear the last question. This, I, I saved this question for last on purpose because I need you to understand your role in spiritual warfare. Somebody asked this question, and I want to say, thank God somebody finally asked a question like this. They asked, hey, can anybody, and I'm going to qualify the word anybody right now, any Christian, can any Christian drive out a demon? Because I know the person who sent this question is in, and I kind of know where I think they were going with this, 
when they ask the question, can anyone drive out a demon? My answer is yes. Now wait just a moment. I need you to understand two things. One, Bible scholars are hotly divided on this question. There are some very good, very sound Bible scholars out there who believe that the ability to do supernatural miracles, God working supernatural miracles of healing and tongues and prophecy and driving out demons, that ended when the last of Jesus' original disciples died, when John the apostle died. Many, some Bible scholars believe that. I don't. I don't believe it for two reasons. One, I don't believe God places those kind of restrictions. I don't see anything in scripture that causes me to believe what we read about in the book of Acts cannot and in fact does not continue to this day. But there's a second reason. I never thought this would ever come up in a sermon, so I've just never shared it. I was teaching university at the University of Louisville in Kentucky as an ROTC instructor. I was a sergeant. I was also going to seminary on my own time, and I was doing my best try, trying to influence the university students that God was bringing in front of me and trying to be open with them about my faith. I had the chance in the few years that I was there to lead several of them to faith in Christ. I had a chance to baptize some of them. I even performed the wedding ceremony for some of my own students when they got married. One day, one of my students came and knocked on my door. I'm a sergeant in the army and an ROTC instructor. And she came down and sat in my office, very distraught. And she said, I have a demon and I need you to perform an exorcism right now. Now, can I just tell you, <laughs> there was no class in seminary on what to do next. Like, none of my professors even touched this thing with a 10-foot pole. And so I'm standing in front of this young woman with my mouth open, having no idea what to do next. But I could feel the presence of evil in this room, and I could see the torment that she was on. And she's saying, I'm serious. I need you right now to do something about this. And so I just simply sat next to her and started to pray for her. And when I started to pray for her, I got real angry about this torment that this beautiful creation of God was under, this woman who was created in the image of God, like I would be angry about any man or any woman that is under torment of the evil one. I started to invoke the name of Jesus. I don't even know where this came from. And I started to pray that this demon would leave her. And I felt anger like I have never felt in a prayer before. I felt this righteous indignation. And I felt this burning sensation. And then this woman just went through this transformation right in front of my eyes. And the young lady who walked out the doors of my office walked out very different then she walked in the doors. I've never experienced anything like that since. I was totally not ready for that when she sat down and said, I need you, Jeff, right now to do something about this. But I sat there and thought to myself, if the Holy Spirit of the living God is inside of me, he that is in me, listen to me, Christian, is greater than he that's in the world. And if you need me to pray over you right now, Jeff holds no power, thank you. <laughs> Jeff holds no power to cast out this demon, but the one that's inside of me does. And if that's what you need, then I will invoke the name of the one that's inside of me. So I want you to see from the book of Acts what happens to a regular dude, not one of Jesus' original disciples, but a regular dude by the name of Philip in Acts chapter 8. Because the Bible describes it this way. The crowds were all paying attention to what Philip, who is a deacon in the church and kind of a regular dude who's just been selected to serve some of the widows in the church. The crowds were all paying attention to what Philip said. And they listened and saw the signs that he was performing. And here's the signs. The Bible's going to list them for us now. For unclean spirits 
crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was great joy in the city. And there was joy in the city because a regular dude just like you by the name of Philip showed up, and people were being tormented around him. And Philip said, oh no, in the name of Jesus Christ, he performs an exorcism, and the spirits come out in such a way that the people in town can tell there's something different. And I believe that God to this day still uses people, his people, to do the same thing today that he did through Paul and Peter and James when they were alive, that he did through Philip when he was alive. Now, I want you to know something. I did, I did a little research on Philip before this sermon today. We don't know a whole lot about this guy. Maybe Philip never even met Jesus personally. Maybe he heard about Jesus from one of the original disciples. We do know this. He's a good man, and he's full of the Holy Spirit because he's one of the seven guys in the church selected to serve widows, and the only criteria for selection is they got to be a good man and full of the Holy Spirit. Philip is such a good man that he passes his faith on to his family. And later on in the book of Acts, Philip has four daughters, and all four of those daughters want the world to know about King Jesus, so they're prophesying, and they're making a big impact on King Jesus. When somebody sent this question in today, I thought to myself, hallelujah, because now we've finally turned a corner. When we talk spiritual warfare, I think it's natural. I think all of us do this. I do this too. The first thing that we think about is ourselves and our soul and the attack on our soul. And you should think in those terms. Don't get me wrong. But when we got to question number four, now we start to think about not just my soul, but I I care about the soul of my cousin. And I want to know where are they going to spend eternity? I think about the soul of my coworker. I see them every day, all day long, and I care about what's going on in their soul. And God, maybe they're under the control, under the possession of the evil one. I think about my acquaintance who I follow on social media or who I stay in touch with irregularly, and I'm starting to wonder about their soul. Because Jesus, I believe you called me out of my sin and into a relationship with me for your glory, or you called me into a relationship with you for your glory and for my good. And so I care about my soul, the first three questions today, but I care about the soul of my neighbor because you've called me to explain the good news and to make a difference. And when I do that, the Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who turns from the evil one and starts to follow King Jesus. And so I want to put a couple of challenges before you. I have been praying all week long that somebody tunes into this broadcast who fits into question or category number one. They realize, "Uh uh-oh, my soul belongs to the evil one, and I can't fix this. I am a prisoner. He has tyranny over me. He has rule over me that I can't stop. And so, Jesus, I need you to cross over enemy lines. I need you to go on a suicide mission. Jesus, I need you to rescue me from the evil one. I need you to change my soul today. And if that's you, in just a second, I'm going to say a prayer for you, and I'm going to ask that God would do the greatest miracle that will ever happen in human history, a miracle that impacts all of eternity, that God would radically change your soul. But for everybody else who's watching this, my prayer is that this sermon today has helped you be armed and ready to fight. You don't go into a battle without being armed. That's insane. So you go prepared by the word of God, the, the, uh, the word of scripture that we are aware of. And that's why we studied the Bible today and didn't bring in outside sources. But you go out from this room recognizing I'm a spiritual person in a spiritual place and there is a very real spiritual war happening all around me. So would you just bow your heads and can I pray for you right now like I need to pray for my soul right now. Father, we've opened up your word. We've sung about the good news today when we sang about your grace. 
And we've opened up the Bible today, and we've seen very real presence of evil all throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament. And God, you have made it very clear from the Bible today that until Jesus steps in, until he starts to work a miracle, until he softens the human heart and makes them ready to repent and to turn to him, all people, everybody on the planet is under the possession or the prisoner of the devil. And so, God, I'm asking that you do a miracle right now. Don't do this for me. Don't do this because of this church. God, do this for your glory. Would you change somebody's soul right now? Would you cause them to just cry out a prayer that says, God, I can't fix this, but I know my soul needs to change. And I'm asking by the blood of your son, Jesus, that you would step in and you would do for me what I can't do for myself. And God, if you'll change me, if you'll save me from this moment forward, I will follow you, which means anywhere you ask me to go, whatever you ask me to give up, I will give it up for you and for your glory. God, would you hear that prayer from heaven? And I am believing that right now people are praying to you and asking for forgiveness for their sins for the first time and meaning it. And I'm asking that you would change them. But Father, I'm praying for my soul. I'm praying for the brothers and sisters, those that have been claimed by Jesus, for everyone who's listening to this broadcast who has been born again. God, would you help us go out this week strapped and ready to fight? ready to engage in spiritual warfare. Maybe that's for a cousin or a coworker. Maybe it's just to protect our own heart right now, recognizing how vulnerable we are right now. God, whatever it is, help us not to bury our heads in the sand because no one can escape from this fight. So help us to trust you and to believe that the one that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. And I will be aware but I will not be afraid this week. God, would you use this sermon this week to help your people? And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.